Okay, well, hi, Addison. Thank you so much for doing this. I always ask the guests to do a small sort of introduction of who they are and how they got to where they're at. Uh, so if you can just tell people about yourself. I know we had a conversation, it was probably two years ago. Um, so if people haven't listened to that, I encourage them to do so. But otherwise, yeah, what, what, what's happening and, and tell us about yourself. Yes, of course. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, my name is Addison Brazil. I guess right now, more than anything, I'm the author of my book, First Year of Grief Club, A Gift from a Friend Who Gets It. Um, and I guess in order to understand how a 33-year-old guy writes a book about grief and offers it to other people, <laughs> you have to understand that I navigated through some very complex um grief processes through throughout my 20s. I, I lost my brother to an inoperable brain tumor just sort of on the cusp of my 20s. Um, and then a few years later, I found my father after his suicide. Um, and then I sort of went out in the world and tried to fix my mental health, which we talked a little bit about last time where I just sort of went out and, and tried to figure out how to fix everything that these deaths, um, you know, losing both my brother and my father before 25, created for me. And, and I think I thought I had done it, to be honest. I, I think I thought I figured it out that I could sort of have this master of vices mixture of modalities thing. And it was like, I'm good. I be grief. And I actually kind of started celebrating that a little bit. And, um, and one night I was out celebrating and, and on the way home, we got into a very, very bad accident and I lost a, a dear friend of mine. And I was left relearning to walk and with a brain injury and hospitalized and basically got, um, another really big reset. Uh, and it came with a total new, you know, um, scheme of, of, of issues and challenges to navigate because there was this also this physical aspect um, and um, just a totally different grief process. So from those three grief processes, I became sort of this grief guy that people would always come to or call whenever something happened. And the funny part is even having been through all that, whenever somebody would do that, I would just sort of freeze. Cause I it was kind of like a Santa's not real thing. I didn't want to tell them what they were really in for, you know, and, and what loss had been like for me. Um, so after 13 years of freezing that turned into more of a soul pull and we get this book where um, I wanted to just offer something that you could give to somebody instead of flowers or casseroles right on day one. Um, if you were to hand me over to a friend or a loved one and I was gonna stay with them every week for a year, what would I really say? And that's sort of where this book came from and um, what, I, what I put out in the world in the last six months, I guess. Yeah, thank you. It, it's... <sighs> You have so many uh, points in the book where you encourage people to do the check-in or the pause. And mm. I guess I'm practicing that right now. Just to hear you describe that, it's, um, yeah, it's moving. It's, so I'm, I'm doing a little check-in, noticing the uh, tingles in my body and, and that stuff and tuning into my breath. I'm, I'm happy to practice what I preach to and, and check in because I this episode's kind of special because I really wasn't sure when when you extended the date to me because we already rescheduled once and then yes, the date came yes. and it's actually the eve of the 10 year anniversary of my father's suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and that is coming with a lot in the book. I say, you know, grief is not something you want or it's not something you fix. It's something you honor. And it's funny when you go into these conversations, you're like, OK, dude, you're really going to be honoring today like you're really like going to be chewing on that that offering and so I just I do want to you know check in and say that I'm really viscerally so much in my grief today and feeling so much and and I'm, I'm happy to be in this safe space but I would you know I wouldn't be being authentic to myself if I didn't admit the exact timing of this conversation and and how much of what I'll probably say today to your questions will be tested by the fact that I'm actually really in you know my grief right now um, and not maybe as spokesperson or advocate Addison as sometimes I can you know kind of jump into so um, thank you for checking in and thank you for reminding me to check in yeah <sighs> It's just nice to sit with those things. 
Um, Maybe we could just so, do deep breaths for the next hour. Yeah, we don't have to talk yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I'm trying to get out of it. Now I'm like, oh God. <laughs> uh, uh, so I actually, from what you were just mentioning, as you sort of gave that picture of kind of how you got here, there was a part in the book, is jumping ahead in my notes a bit, but where you mentioned when, you know, I might get the um, order wrong, but I think I got it. It was like when your brother died, you went into overachieving. When your dad died, you kind of withdrew. And then when your friend passed and you had the car accident, I can't remember what the, how you summarized that, but maybe because you kind of just mentioned it a minute ago. So yeah, can you I just for, expand for on that? Things? Yeah, for you know, when my brother passed, it was also something we were aware was happening, was going to happen, you know, because he had an inoperable brain tumor and, you know, there's doctors and, you know, palliative care and, and you know, that moment is sort of coming. Um, and I was at the time dancing on scholarship at a school. I had already kind of set my own purpose, which is actually in retrospect, very lucky for me in my grief process that I, I was already aligned so heavily with something I wanted to get back to that I wanted to fight for regardless of, you know, how heartbreaking it was and, and sort of in honor of him. And, and my brother's death being, you know, I was 19 and he was 17 and I like was all my dreams were coming true and coming back from my first year of truly the best year of my life. Cause again, that was the last time my whole family was alive. It was my first year of school. Like, you know, it was just like, it was incredible. And there was some, with my brother being the older brother, there was this in inheritance and pre-inheritance cause I started the, the nonprofit that helped other people with brain tumors before he even passed so that he could be a part of the process. But I inherited this sort of, sort this feeling of like, I want to do everything that he can't do, or I want to do everything I want to do because I get to. And not everyone in my family had that at all. I wanted to, you know, eating things that he liked made parts of my family upset and they withdrew from that. I wanted to eat twice as much. Like that was just my very natural response to, to his passing and the type of person he was. And then obviously with my father's death, very unexpected, um, and very traumatizing. And it came with, with PTSD, you know, it came with this diagnosis and, and, and this, this calibrating of trying to understand emotionally and physically this trauma, but also that it wasn't just this trauma that we needed to resolve, like as if I had seen a stranger, you know, after they died by suicide, but this was my father. This was the attachment I had to the man I thought that would always be there to protect me. Um, and I, and I lovingly felt obviously very unprotected in that moment because, you know, of what I experienced. And so, you know, like I said, I went out in the world and then with the, what happened with the accident, what I often say, it was almost like at that point I was trying to run windows on Mac. It was just like a full restart, like the system, it, it the operating system had to be updated, recoded. Like I just, I could not function or live in a world where these things were possible. And yet I needed to and had to, if I wasn't going to fall into the male suicide statistic as a result of what I had been through. And as you know, from our last conversation, I was very aware from my father's death on about the entire men's mental health movement and what the statistics were against me and what the statistics are even are of somebody who witnesses what I had witnessed. So, so I inherited from my dad more of this need of a mental health education. And so it started with a withdrawn, it started with dealing with the trauma and then it, deal, it, it turned into this real responsibility to you know, kind of sort myself out and, and figure out how I was gonna, how I was gonna move forward and what, what true resilience looked like because a lot of what was being offered to me was like getting by and I was 24 and I was like, what if I live till I'm a hundred? Like, I don't want to get by, you know, like this is obviously so unexpected that I'd be in this position, but you know, I, I still want to thrive. And as much as that was tangled in a grief process with grief and guilt as well, that I got to have those feelings and got to do all that, it was still absolutely necessary to me um, to sort of figure that out, what that looked like, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I guess, how did you do that? What were sort of... You know, it was, it was a lot of 
fixing. And it's, it's really, it's much easier to speak about it now because I also understand through all my own research, what was actually happening. But in that moment, especially, you know, when it was 14 years ago or 10 years ago with my father, or even now four years ago or five years ago since the accident, you know, it, it was a lot more of wandering around in the dark. I didn't really understand what was happening. And, and I just sort of, it was kind of like, I use this analogy a lot, but, you know, someone can put a nail on the table and say the nail needs to go in the wall. And there's just sort of this room around you of things and you don't know what a hammer is. You don't know that that's what its job is. There's so many ways to get a nail in a wall. And, you know, I started by using my own palm and, and like it made, you know, marks on me and hurt me <laughs> to do it, but I got it done, you know? And then maybe I went to like a shoe, it works, but you know, it's like leaving a print on the wall and it's cracking. And like, so it's like, you get how the metaphor goes to eventually where you pick up this thing, which we know as a hammer that has like a grip for my hand specifically and is meant to perfectly put a nail in a wall without creating any damage. And so that's sort of what that process was like for me. And, and what that process was like with me is every time I tried to fix it, every time I tried to get rid of it, Every time I tried mm. to exit grief club, um, I, I had a really hard mental health lesson that would follow very quickly because that just wasn't possible. And so it became this idea and sort of the basis of this book of, you know, not learning to live without someone or something, but learning who you are now within that loss. And so it's a series of experiments of getting to know yourself and not trying to fix anything, but honoring what comes up. And it's like, okay, what do you mean? Like honor what comes up? But just like we did at the start of this call, today was very different and has been very different because what today is for me. Today, 10 years ago, there were things I still could have done. And I'm gonna try not to get emotional, but that is the reality of my today. When I think about July 20th, every year, all the days leading up to July 21st, I know where I was and I know that there was things that could have been done to maybe change this horrible thing. And then on July 21st, even though it seems like it's the big bad day, there's usually a release. There's, and we're past the point where something could have been done. And that's sort of the way my, my mind goes. So, you know, honoring the journey is in, in each of those days and every day before or after, I'm waking up every morning and checking in with myself and actually based on how I'm feeling and how I'm doing, making decisions and adjusting my day and using my own tools from, from those experiments I've done over time based on what's coming up, you know? So it's not gonna be a one thing, like you might have headache and this certain medicine that you go to, you know, this is like the most complex headache of all time and different things are going to help it. So it's this thing where I go, okay, so, you know, there's a lot of anxiousness here. There's, you know, this, the, this tendency that I, I want to ruminate. I know I want to ruminate today. And so all day today, I've been pulling out my, we're only in this moment presence tool. And that might look totally different to somebody else. But for me, I know exactly what this is. And I, and I just gently keep saying to myself, that's not the moment we're in, buddy. Right now, you can smell the grass right now. It's raining in London right now. You know, it's like what? And I it just, it's just going, where are we in this moment? Where are we in this moment? And, but I, that didn't work yesterday. That's not what yesterday was for. Right. So it's this idea of honoring where you're actually at. And it's very difficult to get a point where you're willing to do that because it, it can feel very conflicting to deal with where you're actually at. And it can feel like failure. It felt like failure for me when I would feel this way again, six years later, seven years later, 10 years later, normally before I came to these conclusions, it really would have felt like failure that I'm still feeling this way, but it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's honoring exactly what would come up and, and logically, I mean, yeah, that was my dad and the terrible thing happened. And, you know, so what's going on right now and, and how can I kind of tend to that? So, um, you know, I, I say like, I can't give you a toolkit and I, I can't give you 10 things and tell you where the hammer is and what the screwdriver is when it comes to grief. What I can offer you is spending a year with me and you experiment where you start to identify what your hammer looks like and what your screwdriver looks like and you know where to get them. And also always having the willingness that the second that doesn't work anymore, that there's an upgrade, there's a change, you don't use that tool anymore, whatever, there's, there's no finality. And it's like, I know I sound like a broken record, but I have to tell myself this 10 times a day, every day, there's no fix, buddy. So what's coming up? 
There's no, yeah, I get it. You want it to be over, you know? And it's just, it's naturally like our brains are wired for stories to end, for patterns to complete, for things to be resolved. And this isn't a resolve, you know, grief club starts today, it starts and it ends never. And I didn't want to be the guy that said that originally. And that's why I stayed quiet for 14 years. But now I realize that that can be very, very uplifting in a not in a I'm going to put rainbows on your sadness way, but just in if you get into the realness of what's really going on, there's a lot more opportunity within that to live your life, your real life, Mm -hmm. where that person really passed or you really lost that job or whatever it is. I'm not offering you an alternate. I'm saying to live your real life, which fully acknowledges and I never assume that I know, even with all my grief, that I know anything about anybody else's. It's just scientifically based on their bond and what they've lost, you know? Yeah, wow, that was lovely to listen to. One thing that I find, I guess, so meaningful about what you just said and also in your book and in talking to you last time too is you have you've always you've obviously worked very hard to get to this point or you've practiced a lot and there's just so much wisdom and understanding in what you just said this idea that the mind is always searching for an answer right or this finish line an end to the story and in the book and even in what you just said you share so much sort of wisdom on the paradox, I guess, of how the mind is searching for an answer, yet the answer can't be found, or the answer is noticing what's happening in the present moment. And it's such a shift for people to start training that part of their awareness, I guess, or their mind to be able to do that. And yeah, in the book, there's so many good practices for that, or ways, like you said, to here's a bunch of skills and tools or whatever it is, figure out which ones will work for you. Mm. And I I also like your focus. It's clear in the beginning of the book too, nobody can do this for you. Mm. This is about you making a decision to do this for yourself and you can't change other people. And maybe just as a, a next jumping off point, I just wanted to read this um because it was so awesome and and i had a conversation with two parents who lost a child to suicide Mm -hmm. and when i was reading this part of your book it brought up some of the things that they shared which was amazing and i just want to read this and then um so you say what does support look like for you right now and allow you to respond to them honestly so this is when i guess it's maybe this is from day four, day three, mm. uh, day th- the first week. And, and then, and you say, and I don't know is a perfectly great answer, by the way, which is so <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> we can't change what other people say or do. We can teach people how to treat us around our loss. I wish I'd known this a lot earlier. So, yeah. I don't know yeah. why that made me very <laughs> emotional to hear. I, this is a very odd experience. <laughs> it's like, well, it's, it's so like, you know, real. It's like, there is yeah. a book, but like, it's so true. And like, it's like, yeah. I'm feeling right now for a younger version of myself, almost like an inner child. And I'm like, I, yeah. I know yeah. you wish you knew that, you know, then. So, but I, I think that is such an important thing because there's such an awkwardness around grief, around both how to support people and how to ask for the support you need, especially when you're swirling in grief and you don't even know what support looks like, you know? And that's why, again, it's like this, this going back to the present moment of what does support look like for you in this moment, in Mm -hmm. this second, because sometimes Mm -hmm. we also don't want to answer that question because they think maybe if I say something, then if they complete that, I'm supposed to be better. And I don't ever want to set up that expectation, right? So it's like, if you're supporting someone, you know, people ask me over and over again, like, what should I do or what should I say? And I just, I think casseroles and condolences are like, you know, what we've been taught and so great, but it became like always being touched and always sort of it felt like a stamp was being stamped on me going, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss. Like, I can't imagine what you're going through. Like, and, and there was nothing in that, that, or even how are you can be so overwhelming. 
so over what it, like i don't know how i am you know it's not even how are you feeling in, in north america we say how are you which is also just <laughs> right. doesn't you know um so you know or how are you doing and it's like i don't know what i'm doing i'm flailing you know and i know there's only a certain amount of time before i need to start treading strategically because i'm not getting out of this water like that's what's becoming clearer and clearer with every second is like, I can't reverse this and I'm in this water, this grief now. So, you know, I really love to empower that, you know, my book is written for the griever, but we do teach people how to treat us and people will ask like, you know, what would be best? And those are your, your kind of moments, those teachable moments to say, you know, that resilience response is like what I call them in the book is, is sort yeah. of reframing things and helping people to help you. So, you know, you know, what would really help right now is this, or I don't really know, and I don't want to know, but I think I would like you to be in the room and not talk. And that's one that I use a lot because I never said that, but that's what I always wanted to say. I have a tendency to ruminate and I'm trying to in overdrive, understand what's happened in my life. But I also am very aware that that's not healthy to do all day, every day. So I don't want to be alone, but I don't want to be touched. So I want someone to sit in the room and it's like so specific, but when I really tapped into it the third time around, you know, just because of what happened to me, I kind of had to ask for what I really needed. And, you know, we have like adopted this term in our family, like a pocket pal, like in it, you know, they kind of come over and do what you're doing during the day. And it's not a thing, but you have someone else there, you know, and all of my very good friends and close family members know exactly what that means. It's like, can we have a pocket pal day where you're just there and we don't have to talk about it but we're also not going to ignore it we're honoring it by you being in the space because i want someone in the space you know so yeah i think it's really diving into that question for yourself and there's a tendency and even in like a lot of the grief world right now to sort of attack the supporters because they don't know how to support and you know the things they say and like I get that and it's very frustrating and there's another week where you can honor all the anger you want um, <laughs> and find a healthy outlet for that but also there's a little bit of responsibility that unfortunately comes with grief you know you are entering a club and there your life is different now and you know it's like I hate like I hate that it's like wait I have to do this I have to do more I'm the one who lost someone and it's like yeah if you if you want to enjoy your life at all yeah there's going to be some things to do here and some tools to develop and you're going to kind of you know constantly have to just be honoring what's what's going on yeah wow well, um that idea of I love how you put it I don't, I, your presence in the room is enough. Like I don't want to be touched or, or even spoken to perhaps resonates so much with me. So, and, and I think, as you also say, in, in alignment with building the skill set, different people, well, different days, different moments, different situations might call for us to want to be spoken to or touched mm -hmm. or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Others may not. And being able to, this is why your the check-in practices are so useful is, and and later in the book. So I'm just laughing because I want to remind everyone because yeah. this thing happened where people will say to this day, oh, uh -huh. Addison doesn't like to be touched even before <laughs> people. And, and I now, because I wasn't checking in with myself, as you're saying, and I wasn't keeping it loose uh -huh. to what I really wanted. I made hard rules when I was younger because I didn't know I didn't know any of this, right? So it was yes. like, it became no one's allowed to touch me, which was very detrimental to going through the next 10 years of because I did <laughs> want to be hugged, but then I didn't want to awkwardly like have to bring it back in so that no mm. one was touching me. And I, I did want, you know, and so it is always of the moment and that that is a bravery and that is something that, so I'm saying you'll always have the opportunity opportunity to teach people how to treat you it's not one lecture it's not one yeah. set of rules yeah. you know it's always in the moment and be careful because you you know people think they're helping by then telling everyone else in the world don't touch him and it's like <laughs> well no i literally as a human being need like oxytocin and like you know yeah, to be touched yeah, yeah. you know especially through all this process and i think i'm a whole thing 10 years later i worked through with a life coach of like breaking down this addison doesn't like to be touched limited <laughs> belief that i created you know so you know, I always like to find the funny in it. And so when something like that pops up, it's like, you know, yeah, just be honest in each moment what it is because hard and fast rules, again, don't, don't serve you. 
you know, mm. maybe for a period mm. of time, but not, not always for the, the whole run, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's such a nice reflection to one to notice that that's what you're doing. And then to also take for lack of a better word, maybe res the responsibility to then start asking again for what you need or, or to acknowledge in yourself that maybe this isn't serving me anymore. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it did enter, who knows, or. And if you, um, if you hate, I yeah. hated the word responsibility. If anyone listening yeah. hates it, I, there is, there, you know, this grief is real and there's going to be a long where you don't want to listen to this and you don't want to read this book. It's not the first year as in, if you didn't pick it up on the first day, you've missed the book. It's the first year you're ready to honor and experiment through what you've been through. That year can mm. come 10 years from now. So I just like, mm. always like to say that. And, and also I used to have sort of my own personal negative connotation to that idea of responsibility like I you know it's like spider-man rules with great power comes great responsibility kind yeah. of thing and you know when someone said it to me as um ensuring you can be response able like able to respond you know and I know that's sort of like a mindset like we all kind of know that one but that reminder is something that I needed often is to think about it as like it's actually like I'm making it so that I'm able to respond to life to the things I still want, to what's going on. And by asking people and teaching people around me how to keep me that way, that is a part of this process. Cause sometimes like, yeah, we both kind of obviously have this idea that responsibility is something that, you know, comes with some sort of burden or rules or more on me kind of thing. Yes, yes. And, but making sure I'm always response able is something I want to sign up for. <laughs> like I'll subscribe to that, you know? <laughs> so I just, yes. I, I always kind of did that switch for me but certainly like yeah there's there's always with your own mental health the responsibility is to yourself and you know and to others in that way yeah 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 and it it's a nice way to reframe it so that it's more a no more sort of an open relationship i guess to the word or to what mm -hmm. it actually means in practice right. um I, I wanted, I would just want to read one part, another part from this, which is so awesome in the resilience responses. Um, when somebody says, are you sure you're okay? And then you say, if they say this, just hit them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something like I'm feeling so many things right now, but if I can figure out what I need in terms of support, I will reach out. That, that takes some practice right to be able to say that and, and to mm -hmm. be able to <laughs> not want to hit the person no I don't know that's there's like your humor in there and also the seriousness of how you right and I, th yeah. I think that it's it's you know always going back to what makes you 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 know and bringing that into this process is really important so for me personally humor is a non-negotiable Basically, for me, if I'm not finding the funny in things, I, it'd be the same as them saying he no longer has a pulse. Like, it's just, it's, that's mm -hmm. how inbred it is into me and the culture of my family. Um, you know, other people would never understand, but like the hardest I've ever laughed has been in, in the limousine hearses on the way to burials. Like, I mean, that's just like, when we really realized this was really happening, you know, it was like almost funny because it was that unbelievable at that time. And obviously, mm. you know, there's shock with that or whatever, but, mm. you know, so for me, allowing that humor in and then, you know, going into like, whatever the response is like, and, and. I think what I was really trying to set up there is, you know, if you don't know, but, but creating that opportunity to later say to someone, but if I do know, I will reach out. And so that there's not that awkwardness when that does come up, you know, and, and being able to sort of put that, put that moment there. Cause there's a lot of calibrating that's going to go on. And, and, you know, in the moment, I, of course, like, you know, when my grief processes started, I was an A type too, but I could not fix me, but it seemed like either was a way to make the person who was trying to console me feel better. And so at least someone got something out of it. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit backwards, but I could be like, you know, you being here has, 
you know, made this better for me or like, you know, like hugging them. Like it, it, there's almost like an inference sometimes really quickly of the griever actually then consoling the person who's there to give condolences. And it's, it's sort of this, you know, they just can't believe what's happened to you. And then, you know, you're helping them to believe something that you don't believe yet, <laughs> but you're aware that's going to be a bigger process. And it's certainly not going to happen in a welcoming line at a Portuguese Catholic funeral with 200 people in tow, you know, like right. that's just yeah. not where that's going to happen. So that's an, that, that idea of, of, you know, setting up for the silence that's going to come later is very important because it is going to come, all the formalities fade away. And that's in the privilege of formalities. Obviously we're coming out of a pandemic where people didn't even get to have community driven memorials or anything like that. That's a whole nother conversation, you know, but, but no matter what's done sort of the, it does fade away that initial support and that initial surrounding. And that's sort of when you need it the most is just that little bit later when you're coming to terms with it. So always being willing to say, you know, there's nothing right now I can think of, but is it okay if I call on you when I do think of something, you know, and setting that up so that later you, that other part of your brain that tries to convince you you're being a bother is like, no, we actually have an open contract that like, I can do this and I can, you know, and I, I myself, before I wrote this book, I rarely send flowers, food, anything when something happens. i go into my calendar and I write something down for a month later or 60 days later and I'll send something then because I know that's when nothing like that's happening you know and that's when it's hitting hard and, and you're feeling sort of the loneliness of the truth of what's going on at least for me you know I, I know that that was sort of um you know and everyone needs a break eventually from lasagnas if, if that's what's being delivered <laughs> wow uh, the I do want to sort of moving through the book, the, and I really I kind of admire how you, you address the stages of grief, which are kind of relatively well accepted in the general knowledge around these things. Um, I like that you point them out and sort of move on in some ways. Yeah, uh, I just wanted yeah. to bring up that like, they've basically been disproven, you know, from a scientist point of view, even, you know, and that's something I've learned even more so since I've written the book, but wow. it's because they're ingrained in us. I mean, that book, Elizabeth Kluber, which she was interviewing people who were dying. She wasn't interviewing people who had lost someone. So that okay. book at the time was revolutionary and amazing, but it also actually wasn't originally about grief. She was identifying in categories of people in a non-scientific way through interviews, you know, these, these similar themes. And then okay. they got, I don't know if it was ever intentional, but they got put into the, this order. And right. so the reason that I wanted to address it is because that has downloaded into our programming. We all know about right. these stages of grief, even though we don't really know how, because I don't think I got taught that in school, but like, you know, it comes up whether, you know, maybe it was in like psych 101 or something, I don't know, at some point, but we all hear about these stages of grief. And then this idea of stages in the way our brain works, it's like, let's, let's get rid of that right away because there's no stages. They all swirl together. They are circular in nature. They will come back. It's more like scribbling, you know, and you'll, you'll circle back and you'll feel all of them at once. And, you know, it's where, you know, you kind of naturally feel that, but no one really said that to me you know, and I was expecting to go through these stages and I was expecting acceptance to be the final stage where I got my certificate and I don't have to grieve anymore <laughs> right. um, or deal with grief, period. Um, and all you can really ever do is accept the moment you're in. So obviously that's going to be secular. Obviously that's going to recur. And obviously mm. as a human being, as new triggers and new relationships and new experiences happen, you know, you're going to go through all of these things, which she so beautifully thematically found people at the end of their life were feeling. Um, so that, like, I, I always kind of like, like to bring that up. And then it's kind of funny, but I just want to say to people after this book came out, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just a friend who gets it. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a coach. I'm not a scientist. I'm not definitely not a neuroscientist, you know? And I, and I, all of a sudden I was like, Oh, I really like science though. Like maybe I should have done this, you know? And I, and I wanted to take it back. 
And it was so weird, the timing of this, but this book came out and I have it with me here. It's called The Grieving Brain by Mary Frances O'Connor. And she has, she has studied the neurobiology of grief for the last 20 years. And what is insane is you'll see if this video ever exists, but there's so many post-its and more of the book is highlighted than unhighlighted. I should have just circled the parts that I didn't <laughs> want to highlight. But from a scientific perspective, almost everything I naturally came to is proven in all of her studies. You know, it, I, she kind of is this like godmother on my shoulder being like, yeah, there's actually science to back up everything you naturally wanted to offer a friend. And here's right. why, you know, in this yeah. whole process of what our brains actually doing. And I, I really think they're just such a beautiful matching because understanding from the beginning what's happening in the brain and how we attach to people and what's what's really happening um was just i don't know so enlightening to me but so 13 years after i was going you know through many of those processes and it makes so much sense to me now but one really cool thing that i i like to bring up is this idea of like and it comes from this book is if i were to ask you right now like name your closest living loved one like it, it's not a measuring contest, just someone that you yeah, see all the time yeah. and you're closely attached to whoever it is, yeah, right? My wife or kids. Yeah. So your wife That's and who whoever's listening will name theirs. And yeah, then yeah. tell me right now, if in this moment you needed to see them, how long it would take to get to see them and where they probably are right now. She's in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, if she a, wasn't yeah. home right now do you have an idea of where she would probably be the, yes uh, the places and how long yeah. it would take to get there and and to give yeah. the people listening an idea for me like my older sisters we, we kind of all spread across the world when grief hit she was in australia and it's so weird to wow. think but like i go okay so i'm in london right now i'd have to fly nine hours to dubai then another 13 hours to land in you know brisbane and then either i'd get a taxi or she'd pick me up an hour and a half okay so in 26 hours i could find my sister and she's probably at her place of work in her home or you know, at the beach, because those are the three places she almost always is, at the dog beach. And what we don't realize is that our brain, once we attach to someone, this is the cool like neuroscience that backs up everything that, that we say, why we have to experiment and stay open all the time, is our brain is constantly doing that. We have a virtual map of everyone we feel attached to. And it's mm. subconsciously go knows all of this all the time. And then suddenly you have a person in your life where the map is broken. And that's what grief becomes is the virtual map really aligning with, with what's really happening. And that, like, I keep using this analogy of this operating system. Again, it's so funny. That's how I described it. And then she's like, like literally your operating system, you know, these two maps were not in alignment and you couldn't, you know, fix it. And it's so, it's just, it's so interesting if someone's trying to understand, like, why do I feel crazy or why do I keep thinking about, or why do I keep expecting them to walk through the door or when a certain thing happens? Because for years, your brain has come to expect that that's when you'll see them. Or if you need to see them, that you can get there in a certain amount of time. And so your brain is in a way it's literally broken, you know, mm -hmm. But yeah. we're not acknowledging that and that's not being said really. And so it's just this like sort of feeling like you're drowning in a deep end kind of why do I feel insane all the time for I truly believe in this moment that I could drive to my dad's house like he'll be there. Right. You know, and you, you have this thing. So it, it's a very it's a very interesting thing to like I just to kind of keep with you of like all the things that I would share from that book is that just being really kind and compassionate to yourself through all of these experiments that at the same time that you're doing the experiments that I lay out, there is a, a neurobiological process of you updating these maps of, the, of attachment to love. Grief doesn't start at death. It starts when you attach through love. And so that is when it really started. So it, all the years you knew someone or you knew life to be a certain way is actually what you're working through, not since the day they died. So people say, it's been a month. What's wrong with me? It's been a year. What's wrong with me? I'm updating a map that started 33 years ago when I was born and my father held me against his chest. And I knew every moment of every year of where he was and depended on him. And I'm gritting through my teeth and smiling because this mm. is making me really emotional to think because I truly, truly want to know. And she talks about 
the the way we attach, you know, is here now and, and and close. And close means like how close are you to that person? How close are you, right? And so that's why I've realized from from her book, like why I have such a weird thing with this anniversary is I did ten years is a big number. So I'm not going to be as close to my father as I was when I had that bond and I knew where he was. And I really don't want us to get further apart. I don't want to be any different than I was. And so you see all these patterns start to show up, especially in that first year of grief. You don't want to do new things. You don't, you don't want to go places. You don't want to go somewhere where you used to go with them because then it's real and the closeness changes. And so it's like being really gentle but also getting to understand that that's what happening is like such a beautiful permission slip from Mary Frances, because it's like, really, I just went through those things thinking like I, I was unwell, you know, and I, I just didn't understand why I didn't want to move forward. And there was no way for our, us to remain close at that time from the way I understood the bonds, that that's why I didn't want to do any of those things, you know, and, and that's, that's very difficult, you know, when I think about how much I've changed since you know, since mm. my brother died or since my father died and how much I really did want to stay the same so that I could keep that part of our relationship. I stay true to the closeness I had with them because it's not getting updated in the map, you know? And then there's this whole other side of like with purpose and, you know, with your, your own belief system, closeness can come from other ways. You know, you can, you can maintain a relationship if you so choose to. But um, in, in that first year that we're talking about, really being gentle because to back myself up with science, which I only get to do in interviews because this book wasn't published when my book was published, <laughs> you know, you, you are going through a very natural process of updating your system, you know? Um, and yeah, yeah, Windows doesn't run on Mac. I can tell you firsthand, I said that, but I don't even know what I was talking about, you know? And I used to say that all the time. And now I'm like, well, oh, that's really weird because that's literally what was happening you know? Yeah. Wow. That's so insightful. And yeah, it's so nice to, to hear you describe all that stuff. And I actually didn't know the sort of backstory to those stages of grief. So thank you for sharing that with me. And, and you know, so and just so you listening. know, I didn't either. I didn't yeah, either yeah, till like yeah. two years ago, which is wild right. again, because every, but that's also where where the resources that exist sometimes, you know, it's that's why this whole idea of what in this moment is serving everybody. We're also in a place where we have technology and like, think about everything I just said about the GPS system. We actually have something called social media that also allows us to track someone when they're living, if they're on social media all the time. Just grief is very different than it ever was. And so I read those books originally, but they didn't, one at the time, fulfill my expectation to be fixed. And two, in some way they, they didn't align. They provided me with information that allowed me to feel connected, but it still mm. just wasn't making sense. Like as she describes in this book. And again, it makes sense now why it didn't, you know, these stages, cause it's like, that wasn't what was happening. And I got to really see that firsthand because it was compounding. So technically I should have been done, you know, one. And then I, you know, I'd be like one of those weird diagrams <laughs> because I'd be in three grief processes at once. And like, ideally like in acceptance around my brother, but anger about my, like but bargaining yeah, about my, you yeah, know, yeah, and all yeah. those things are true, but like, that's just not, it couldn't be plotted like a series arc on a TV show to get us mm. all through and out of the mm -hmm. race, you know? So, right. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Is that what you sort of, I assume, well, that's what you mean by the swirl kind of thing, right? Yes, it's like, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You're going. <sighs> yeah, the chapters of the book, um, which the first ones like the silence, which I already kind of talked about, and then like the yeah. swirl. These are sort of my S's of grief. Again, not stages and not in a linear order, but these really big, like themes of my grief that came up that I think might align with people, you know, like the shame that comes up, the surrender that comes up, you know, the show up and how you show up in the world, um, you know, cause there's other ways that it can be said where it didn't really align. And again, you know, today is a perfect example. When I checked in, I was describing a swirl, you know, I was, I'm in yeah, a swirl, right. you yeah, know? Yeah. So um, yeah, they're just that these S's that aligned with me. And if they can, if someone can, you know, you know, right, swirl on a candle and light it every time you're in the swirl, you know, just to acknowledge that that's what it is, even if it's just for you, you know what I mean? Like, to be like, I know what this is, and I know where I'm at. Um, and, you know, my map's updating. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> so nice to, I guess, 
my mind's going in two dire directions because you get into these self-compassion practices, which are mm. so beautiful. Like one, <clears throat> the one of writing a letter to yourself or to your, a part of yourself um, is so beautiful. Um, mm. And I think you said somewhere in there, we actually need to hear from or speak to that part of ourself. And, and you, yeah, I like how you worded it at mm. something like, um, it may seem weird, or not necessary but it actually is so necessary mm -hmm. it's it's like the part of us that i think that the part of me that believed my father would always be there or my brother and i would grow old together mm -hmm. who we are raw today my friends sorry yes. i am trying no, to i don't want to lose yeah. enunciation <laughs> um but um you know the part of me that believed that is a part of me i've actually been that I became very aware of after this book was released. It was like, you're mm. done with the giving. Hey, me, very specific nine-year-old version of myself. I can see exactly what I look like. And that's the guy that believed all the things that, you know, eventually we had to um, come to believe. And we have all these rites of passages about sitting, sitting kids down and saying, hey, so you know the guy we told you that can go to everyone's house on the 24th eve of every year and deliver presents? Yeah, we got to talk about that. And I, I'm always like wording it in a weird way in case someone's listening in the car because I do not <laughs> want to end any magic early. But, you know, with the teeth and the bunny, there's like these conversations that we have. And then we kind of jump right into the birds and the bees. And there isn't this sort of conversation of like this belief that you have that it will always be this way and that you know no no one's going anywhere is is not dealt with in the same way and and mm. often the way you learn that is is when you experience your first death and i have friends my age that have really not lost anyone yet you know so they haven't had you know and they've learned through me a lot of my friends about grief and know that they do not want to subscribe and they don't they're not looking you know they don't want that but you know so i think this idea of being gentle and thinking about it and also to before a lot of self-work, I was not very nice the way I spoke to myself. So when I picture how I would explain it to a child, because that's who needs to hear from me right now is that younger version of myself that this doesn't make sense to. And just in every way, and you've, you've maybe picked up on a little bit about whenever I go into self-talk, when we're talking about any of the experiments, the way I speak is like I'm speaking to my godson. And I think of my godson specifically because mm. I love him more than anything. And there's no way I would explain something to him without that love there, especially something difficult, which is starting to happen because he's getting very smart and, you know, starting to have these conversations where, well, that's my dad. Mm -hmm. Where's your dad? You know, or what does his middle name mean? It's like, oh God, like, do I do this or do I pass this off? But that's who, that, that idea of always going back to that. And once you write that initial child, that letter to a child, you know, that you love or to yourself, if, if, you know, when you were younger, but the idea is to set that tone of that, like really gentle, compassionate self-talk and inviting curiosity back into your life, like a child would and being okay with every question because you're learning again. And it's just very different than saying, yes, Addison, dad died by suicide. You saw it yourself. Stop. You know, that's literally, if I'm being honest right now, how I was speaking to myself at that time going, Hey bud, I know this is going to sound really difficult and it's, it's really, really, really sad. You know, I can't even do it, but you know, mm -hmm. and it's totally different and it's setting that tone from week one. That's why I put that on the seventh day. Hey, there's someone else we need to explain this to, whether it's the children in your life or the child inside of you, but in a very sensitive, delicate way at baseline roots of what love is and how we, you know, talk to a loving being, what went down, what's going on. Um, and I think it sets that tone for days where, you know, I'll do these experiments and I'll create a tool and then I'm not using the tool. And then instead of getting angry and having this negative self-talk around feeling like a failure, because I know what helps me and I'm not even doing it. I'm not serving myself. How can I be so dumb after all this money and this life coaching and therapy, you know, but then it's like, no, 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 no. Go back to the way you spoke in that letter. Hey buddy, it's okay. We can meditate now. We can throw this one away. It's tomorrow you're going to have a different relationship to all of these things. It's not that big. Hey, buddy, you know, and going back to that and going back to that. So it's setting that tone of that being a very natural thing, because whether we admit it or not, we're going to be talking to ourselves a lot about this loss and the way we do it, I think 
can fast track a sense of healing and a sense of, you know, beauty in the way that, you know, are compassionate with yourself. And that's why I keep bringing up in the book, ask yourself, am I being kind? Am I being compassionate? Am I staying curious? And those are all to yourself in relationship to yourself, of course, and to others, but to you, are you truly being kind about what is going on right now? And, you know, that you're in the deep end and you're treading and there's no, you know, you can't get out of the water, you know? Um, Yeah. yeah, I think that's, um, that's, that's one thing that I often don't say when people say, what's one thing you wish you could tell someone, you know, and I guess I worked out because I put it in a book. So obviously it's something that I would say to people, <laughs> but like, you know, I never think of it, but it really does set that tone. And it really does start to train your brain, teach yourself how to treat yourself from yes. day one yes. that yes. you're, you, this is, you know, that's her biggest thing is that grief in her book that she says, you know, grief is, is a learning process above all else. It's a learning process. And it's, it's something we don't want to learn. It's going to be your least favorite subject in school, but it's a learning process, right? So, you know, signing up for that and and deciding how you're going to teach, you know, really like a child's mind to navigate this loss, I think is very, very important. And I'm sort of dwelling on this because I'm also reminding myself that I know this as I'm saying it right now, because of how I'm feeling today. And maybe that that maybe not have been every bit of this morning in the way that I didn't want to deal with how I feel about this anniversary. Um, because as you guys see, the second you tap into that real thing, talking to that kid inside of me or to my godson about this thing that happened that was really terrible, uh, instantly connects me to my true emotions around it, you know, um, and invokes whether I like it or not empathy for myself, who I would love to just hate. You know, that would just be easier, you know, but yeah. So it's uh, the practice never ends. It's again, no destination on that every single day. Are you being kind? Yeah. Yeah. That's just a yeah, beautiful example of the process working in real time. And I mm. think the more we practice doing that, the easier, I don't even, the process of it coming up in the moment is much more freeing or open or something like that and Mm. almost soothing at least for me i know it's quite soothing when i can allow those emotions to come up because they're very much on the surface for me too even listening to you talk it's like i'm welling up and Mm. and that's empowering and i think we learn that that's not scary right that's okay that's actually helpful in some sense or something Mm -hmm. like that and that becomes you know, your subconscious is not that way naturally. So the, the go-to yes. can become that if you do it enough times, yes, you know, yes. where like you naturally did at the beginning of this conversation, taking those deep breaths, you know, like that, that mm. becomes the go-to, you know, and becomes right, an invitation right. for everyone around you, you know, it's like, oh, I want <laughs> in on that. I talk about that on every page of this book, take a breath. And then I'm rambling about death and not breathing, <laughs> you know? So it's, mm. you know, it's that, oh, okay, good. I get to learn moment rather than, oh God, I'm about to learn something more about grief, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that process of, I can't remember where it's in the book, but along this thing of self-compassion of what do I, I love me wrote it in the, what do I need to hear right now? Mm. And that for me, my experience of working on myself and helping others, that that self-compassionate phrase is literally, what do I need to hear right now? Mm -hmm. And that does take practice to cultivate that internal voice, because as you said, I think maybe it's more of a Western thing, although I even think those boundaries are a bit fake or not real but we tend to be very Mm self-critical and so that inner wiring of yeah i'm stupid or i'm not doing enough or all that sludge um it does take practice to work through that and then when you can get to the point of what do i need to hear right now even from myself yeah from yourself that's the hardest one as you're saying that i'm cringing because i'm like i hate that i even like admit that i you know have to ask myself that because it's also like for me my natural like you're saying is what do i need to do right now 
And what are all the things I could do that would make this hurt less or that I wouldn't have to deal with this? Like would writing another book really quickly get me out of this or would, you know, going on a good date or having someone else love me, would it be, it's like, wait, 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 what do you need to hear right now? And it's very interesting because whenever I've done that and I've been willing to check in, you also align with like your basic, basic needs. And it's like, most of the time it's, I love you. You're safe. Mm-hmm. you're going to be okay. Yeah. I, and I get it. I get it. Like, you know, and it, like I'm thinking it's like, I need to, you know, buy a house and do all these things. And you know what I mean? Like, it's like this achievement oriented, get out of your feelings thing. And it's so, so basic. And, you know, it's like one, there's a responsibility of, of getting to say that to yourself, then, you know, taking the invitation once you hear what you need to hear from yourself. But then also if, if the response is, you're safe, where, where can you go and who can you be around if you want it to be something you share with someone else that would, that makes you feel safe and feel loved and who's likely to let you know that you love them. Now I avoid my mother at all costs because I'm scared her love will just like unravel me. <laughs> you, know, <and> I, <laughs> you know, I lovingly, I think I have this limited belief if I'm mean to my mom, she'll never die because I just can't, I can't, you know, and it's like, we, we yeah. talk about it and, and then, you know, I go back to it of sort of pushing her away, especially when I'm coming and going and traveling for work, you know, when I, when I do get to see her, but, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's taught me a lot though, because that is the person I love more than anything on earth. And the person who knows how to love me the most perfectly in every single way. And my natural inclination is to get rid of her (laughs) because she's too aware of what really happened and what's really going on within me and you know, what's going on. And it's funny because I'll have these conversations with my mom now that, you know, I've evolved and done some self-work and I am apologizing for, you know, I, I, if I ever really am hurting your feelings or if I ever really seem mean. And it's just so interesting when she kind of says back to me, like, uh, yeah, I'm really disappointed in my son who went through all of this stuff, uh, like, you know, has tried to go back and help other people, has survived his own suicidality, you know, all this stuff. And he's a little mean to me in the morning, like, uh, you know, of all the things that could have amounted from the trauma and the loss and the statistically just like, like with addiction or anything, you know, she's like, the way she looks at it is so different. And I'm like, see, that's the thing. That's what you do. You could just love me no matter what I, you know, it's like, ah, I gotta go. I gotta go like you know but it's like even when you're apologizing you're just like oh man you just really love me and because I've come to know what what that love becomes when you lose it I don't know how to like operate within it you know properly as a human being and so I just acknowledge it and apologize for it and then you know each day you know this might sound really silly but I would literally be like when I'm going to my mom's house, like set goals for a full hour. Do not be short. Do not push her away. Hug her when you get there. You know, and it wasn't until I started reading a lot of other people's work and like seeing a lot of different things where I'm going, oh, this is very normal. These half hugs and this like the separation that happens between the people who experience loss like this the most and who the love you need the most you're pushing away because of this, you know, belief that somehow that's going to keep you more secure. Um, it's just something that is a gentle, long process. One that to this day, 14 years later, I'm still like, you know, talking to my mom on the phone and then texting after saying, and sorry if I was short, you know, like, or whatever it is, like, sorry, I got annoyed or sorry, like, you know, and everybody now knows that I'm Canadian born because I just said sorry three times. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. Yeah, so much. It's lovely to hear you articulate all these things so well. Um, And in the in the I think that relates a little bit to the next piece that I have in my notes like around we skipped over it a bit but that I love that idea and I can't remember where I heard it first but you know the gap between who we are and who we want to be or Mm -hmm. that kind of that's how I know it is where Mm -hmm. the suffering lies um which is just so profound and true and you you Mm -hmm. sort of describe how the process about connecting to who we are is bringing those circles together and and maybe can you maybe talk about i love how you you um i guess reference dr anna lemke 
Mm -hmm. That Dopamine Nation book is so mm -hmm. good. And yes, another Lynch. one like this book that kind of yeah. changes your life because it also, again, brings yeah. you into how our brains work in 2022 with everything right. that's around right. us in a technological sense. That is very much a part of a grief process or a mental health healing process. You know, that's that's just a part of everything we do, you know. Yeah, and, and I love that. So you say, let's talk about pro-social shame. Never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. Neither had I. That's when I, one of my teachers, when we work on shame, she brings up this idea of pro-social shame. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, yeah, can you talk about a bit about yeah. just like and I'd, I'd love to interview that here. teacher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's to, wonderful. This is like another one where I really nerd out, but you know, this idea of like, you know, I think the easiest thing for other people to understand this is something like AA where they've, where they've proven and realized that by coming together and openly sharing what may otherwise feel shameful to us or become shameful because it's so silent within us, mm -hmm. you know, actually proves to be quite healing, you know, so looking for connective opportunities. Um, and, you know, I really, this is like hand in hand because rumination is like the dirty, you know, best friend of grief. You know, you also, it's, at a certain point, it, you know, your brain's trying to understand your brain's trying to process over time, of course, but saying things over and over again, the same way and ruminating on them the same way without shifting the action that follows or how you're being supported around it, I don't think is healthy. And again, this is it is backed in Mary Frances's book that, you know, that it's, it's over time not shown to, you know, create resilience. Another great book is The End of Trauma by George Bonanno, which is it actually, these books, what they're really saying and what I'm really saying is that what's already proven is that we're actually a lot more resilient than we think but we don't want to be. And that's sort of, I think in grief, like you said, the separation between those two things is what is and what I would like to be and the suffering in the middle, you know, and aligning to that slowly and being around other people who just get it or, you know, getting to see that representation somewhere else, you know, is again, scientifically proven to really help you through your process. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, I was very interested in it. It really applies to the men's mental health movement. Men move, um, learn experientially. They prefer to learn in that way. And we talked about this the last time I was on. And, you know, that it's proven that, that you know, that's how they bond in that experiential way. Let's all learn together, you know, and normalize it by experience, not by, you know, someone sort of lecturing me or telling me um, or a one-on-one -on -one can feel really odd. Your job is to listen to me. So in some weird way, I don't feel that, you know, we're really connecting because I'm paying you to listen to me for, for an hour. Some people, you know, can feel that way about therapy. So all these things come and go. And, you know, what I'm always getting at in the book is if something stops working for you, like I will be the first to open the window and let's toss it. Like always being willing and not having the judgment around when you use something and why, you know, even Mary Frances says that like avoidance is a tool and it does work through difficult times. I mean, I've spent a lot of time scrolling. I also spent a lot of time after my dad died, literally sitting on my hands and counting because I was too afraid of everything I was feeling and I didn't feel well enough, you know, and I would just count and count and count. And had I been a little bit more Instagram, you know, taught at the time because this was 10 years ago I had just gotten it you know I probably would have been scrolling you know and just like looking through things and looking for every distraction which is all fine and again in that childlike voice that forgiveness can come but I spent a lot of time once those things didn't serve me and I realized it then punishing myself for not realizing it sooner when hmm. there's just this opportunity to go that's it it didn't work good move on stop hammering the nail with your palm like stop talking about that. You hammered the nail with your palm for four years and you just can't believe that I did. You know, it's like the shame that shows up around how you coped. And sometimes I think that's where you really do need to start to build a community community or you really get to build a community around that, those real, real things. The, your real grief club, the people you don't have to explain grief to, you go like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, this one, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I'm having a little bit of that, I'm having a little bit of that, um, you know, and, and, and also being careful that it's not a circle of people just sort of 
complaining about how bad life is yes, because I don't, yes, yes, I've been yes. in those circles and they did not serve <laughs> me, you know? So it's, you know, it's everybody going. And that's one of the things she said, the deal she has with her best friend is if I, if we have the same conversation three times and nothing changes, then please stop me from having it the fourth time. That's the deal she has with her own best friend. And I think that's beautiful. If I'm ruminating and going back over the details of my dad's death, but I haven't taken any action differently you know, since the first time we talked about this and it's three times later, please lovingly ask me to stop and reconsider, you know, what I'm doing and what I've tried since then, you know, and I think, gosh, if that rule existed as a law that was enforced, you know, <laughs> where would we be in the world of, you know, it's like, you know, Einstein's definition of insanity, trying the same yeah. thing over and over again and getting, you know, it's just, that's that's one of the things we naturally do and so it's 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 all in again this learning and and being gentle about when new information comes in that to not start grieving about the time that you didn't know this information like you're grieving about your grief rather than just being like okay and we're here now and this is helpful to me in this moment which is great because the only moment i can live in is this one right. so great you know Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm the, not talking the, to anybody listening or to you, by the way, I'm literally saying all things that I have curated <laughs> over 10 years out loud right now to myself to yeah. get me through the next 24 hours. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm like, kind of like knew all this and I'm an expert in that way. I've just become an expert of my own experience, which is the point of the book for people to get to have that opportunity to just become an expert of your own experience and then be able to draw these conclusions for you for your grief, for your own purposes, you know, not, mm -hmm. it doesn't become something that you can then teach to everybody else, but you'll try, you'll try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really nice reminder though, that when we share these things or, or you make it quite clear is, is this is what I, this is how I process these things. I've learned from these places and these skills and these tools and although I am, you and I are having a conversation where we are also in conversation with ourselves, And that's mm -hmm. such a nice reminder for me too. And I often say that I was speaking to a few hundred high school or no kids in a summer program transitioning into high school. And that same thing of just so you know, I'm not here lecturing you or whatever. I'm basically talking to myself, mm -hmm. but also to you at the same time, because I need the reminder. And to your point around the, the pro-social shame, it's in some ways for me, it's that as well. It's can yeah. I share openly and honestly in this way out loud as though I am sort of also talking to myself or I'm including myself mm -hmm. in, in, and that, I guess, is also that idea of the pro-social shame is because when we hide perhaps, or when we act in ways that are not pro-social, I guess, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, we experience shame. Mm -hmm. So then how can we, how can we act in a way that soothes, soothes the shame? Um, and you just so nicely describe. Which again, yeah, is not easy. And yeah. you're going to have to go back to those reminders every time you try to deal <laughs> yeah, with the yeah. shame, um, you know, and be kind and compassionate to yourself, you know, whenever it comes up and every time, you know, that that's, that's always going to be difficult. And just, you know, for example, when I did my daily, okay, you know, it's kind of like the meeting of the Addisons and how I felt this morning and what was like, I, I'm being interviewed. And then I'm actually interviewing somebody a little later. And I was like, whoa, scheduling Addison, like on the eve of the anniversary, like, you know, but you know, they're, you know, I'm always like, I'm, I'm where I'm meant to be. So this is what's, this is what's meant to happen. But one of the deals that I made with myself around that and my own tendencies is, you know, okay, we're going to do it, but there will be no play by play. Like I am not doing like after the after sports show where then I ruminate about everything we talked about and how I could have or should have said anything. It's like, if we're doing this, that's the deal. And there's that one part of me that's really going to make sure that that deal is kept, you know, because of where I'm at. But to give myself, my friend Shelly Paxton talks about this, um, the author of sabbatical, like to literally write permission slips. And sometimes in grief, like same as talking to that child, sometimes you literally have to give yourself a permission slip, permission slip um, 
one of my most powerful permission slips ever was I'm going to give you the time today to cry. Use it if you want, because I had just literally been fighting the feeling of crying for like a week, you know, but it's like giving yourself permission to do something and to just not engage in the judgment after and knowing that that that's not like it just doesn't happen. It's going, ah, ah, ah that's not the deal. Ah, ah, that's not the deal. Again, just like you would with a kid when you traded off ice cream for them going to bed on time, you know, it's, it's the same yeah. thing, you know? Uh, I know we, we are getting to the end of our time. Uh, well, we got about, and I'm not sure how tight you are, but around 10 minutes or so we scheduled. Yeah. Um, I wanted one thing I, and looking at my notes that I jumped over, which also was kindly, uh, brought into my mind from the same teacher I was talking about the pro-social shame is the, diff- the and I love that you brought this up in the book um, the distinguishing thoughts from feelings so mm-hmm. I just wanted to point that out and then I just go through the rest of my notes and see how we can put it into the last like 10 minutes and and I think okay so the thoughts and feelings thing um, the non-striving which was so nice that you focused on that mm-hmm. surrender um and like the venting and the honesty stuff and the rage anger i know you kind of talked a little bit about that um purpose and meaning and then mm-hmm. also i wrote i love this thing you i can't remember it's towards the end of the book i think um the choices in love so when i do blank i feel mm-hmm like I am loving myself or am I not or whatever. So we got thoughts and feelings, non-striving, surrender, venting, purpose and meaning, choices. Yeah. It's funny because like I started to sweat and then I'm like, wait, this isn't a book report. Like you wrote this. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like well, wait, what, do I, what if I don't know what he's talking about? I'm like, well, you, wrote, you literally wrote this. Um, but um, yeah, you know what? Um, I would say just on the thoughts versus feelings thing. Yeah. Again, like everything I kind of, everything in this book too, like I don't fully explain and it's on purpose because again, it's at the whole, on the whole spectrum of the year, we're building the curiosity tool. We're building the kindness tool and we're building right. the compassion right. tool. So that's built in. So anytime you feel like, oh, I don't really know what he's talking about. There's an intentionality there of, activating giving you something to activate of googling it of finding a youtube video on it of you know because that's the muscle above all the muscles that we're really working here is the finding what works for you muscle because i can never give it to you and no one can give it to me and so on and so forth so um but when it comes to thoughts and feelings versus feelings, that was something that was very central to all the work I've ever done. And when that was explained to me originally by my coach and mentor, Jennifer Merrifield, who I always talk about, I mention her in the book a bunch. Um, I met her by chance on a plane. She was sitting beside me on my way to um, settle my father's complicated estate after five years. And she met a very victim mindsided young man. And I deboarded as someone with this full understanding of life could be a totally different way. Um, And that was the biggest one is that I had never even thought about this idea of like a feeling, obviously you can feel, you know, and a thought (laughs) is is something you think, and it sounds too simple, but how many times do we say, I feel like a failure. I feel like a loser. I feel like I'm not good enough. And that other side of you has to gently start going or gets to gently whenever you're ready um, say, that's not a feeling. I feel like a failure. That's not a feeling. What does that feel like? Um, I feel disconnected. I feel tight in my chest. I feel, you know, and things mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. actually feel with, you know, your senses and, and from an emotion perspective, you know, and starting to do that and just sort of starting to slightly unravel those like wired, it's like a bomb, like, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, you're, you're mm-hmm. kind of always being careful, <laughs> but just starting that, that process of catching yourself and like, okay, that's a thought and just breaking it up. You don't even have to understand the feelings that are underneath it, but just clarifying for yourself, that's a thought. You know, I feel like no one will ever love me because of what I've been through. I used to think was a feeling. That's not Mm -hmm. a feeling. That's a lot of limited beliefs turning into (laughs) a serious thought process that has nothing to do with how I'm feeling in any given moment. 
And the thing is, it can seem overwhelming at first, but what you start to realize is when you build, which I talked about earlier in the book, is that emotional sort of literacy and the ability to talk, which now, again, I've got one godmother coming in with the science and then the other godmother showed up a week after my book came out, Brene Brown with Atlas of the Heart, which allows you to go through and really start to understand how different every emotion is and how you can use it, you know, to really understand what you're going through. So you put those three things together and you've got sort of this encyclopedia of emotions while you're experimenting and also like having the science to understand what you're going through. But, you know, I, I think for me, that was such a cool thing. And what I did with Renee's book is I made a commitment when I first got it was each day I didn't, you know, it's not the type of book I would say that you read all the way through. Each day I would read one emotion and see if that was my understanding of that emotion, if there was anything I would change about my personal definition and what do I know about that? you know, and then the next day, another one. And it's like, you do start to realize the difference in how you're feeling and all the ways you can, you know, you can feel. And, you know, she said, sad, happy, and mad is the three, the three emotions that like the majority of people know, you know, and will use. And there's like mm -hmm. this, you know, in the book, I put the wheel in, you know, yeah, all yeah, these yeah. emotions, you know, of how to describe what you're really going through. So it's, it's very interesting how, how those thoughts differ and what becomes, you know, I'm, I'm feeling tight and lonely versus like, you know, like, and it's like, oh, that thought is two totally different things on two different days and acknowledging how I'm feeling. Um, one of the, one of my, I just have to say this because it was like yeah. the highlight, one of the highlights of my men's mental health movement life was uh, one of my best friend's sisters said that her therapy, her therapist was explaining to her this idea of thoughts versus feelings and she had never heard it before. It was at the end of the session. So she went home and she Googled it. And apparently if you Google thoughts versus feeling, an article that I wrote is the one that comes up. And so for her, it was really weird because I had, you know, she knew me and I yeah. had written, she called me and, and I was just like, these are the things that like you really geek out on though, that like, yeah. that that was yeah. there. And like, you know, again, that that Googling, like, you know, maybe there is something to this where people are getting back to this information and like, you know, that it's just a, like kind of a, a special moment that I came to understand that. And then it's something that other people are seeking to understand. And obviously it's not being talked about if you understand how Google works and my blog, you know, is the thing that's coming up. It's not, it's not obviously not being acknowledged, but it's something we're all doing, you know? So it's definitely there. Um, as far as, um, all I want to say about anger and rage is, is that they became a very big opportunity for me a lot later. Um, understanding what I was angry about usually had nothing to do with what I thought I was angry about. Um, and when I accepted rage as a healthy thing, I realized that mm. rage often was a gateway drug for me to purpose and meaning. What kept me up at night, what I couldn't just not deal with, whether it be the men's mental health movement and suicidality or LGBTQ rights or what, you know, whatever reason I'm not sleeping actually was, if I really felt into it, could be a gateway to maybe how I wanted to create impact in the world. And it doesn't have to be professionally, but it can be in any way. And so I was down at Modern Elder Academy in Baja and Kay Scora um, brought this idea up and we talked about focus and rage. And it was like, how, why are we talking about these two things together? And she was actually experimenting, which is even cooler. And again, proves this idea of like, she was experimenting what will happen if this group of people talk about these two things. And for mm. me, I realized that often they inform my entire life and for grief, for people who are grieving, when you're trying to establish purpose again and meaning again, sometimes your rage and your anger can be very telling of, of where to shine the light and where to put some of your effort and your energy, whether it's what you're doing charitably, what you're doing in a community, what you're doing professionally, what you're writing a book about, because uh, anyone anyone can can do that. I've, I've proven that now, you know, you, you can do that um, if you want to and it serves you, you know, like that whole thing. Yes, but, yes. Um, wow, that was kind of cool how I took four of the points and just put them together. Do I get good. 10 yeah, extra points for, for yeah, slithering? You do. You got <laughs> many, many. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe as a last piece, how, how does the non-striving idea fit into your process and current life with all the work you're doing? And, and what do you have? I think, was it in the book that you, are, are you writing uh, a memoir, so to mm. speak, right? So we may be, Kind of yes. put that together and, and just tell us a bit about what you're sort of working on now and, and have. Come yeah, up. absolutely. Um, so it's funny, this book actually was born out of um, like an unexpected second child or twin out of 
the process that was writing my memoir at the time. So it's very okay. interesting. I didn't actually set out to write this book, but it needed to sort of fall out of me what I would offer someone versus trying to infuse that into my true story. I think those are two very different things. And, and when it comes to like a memoir, if I were to write like a TV show about my life, it needs to be very human and honest to who I am as a person, not necessarily right. as an advocate or, you know, how I would want to help others. And there's yeah. a theme in my life, obviously, with the nonprofit and the way I the way I always find a way to get involved with things, you know, that I, I really do get a lot of purpose. And it's my way of being here to connect with people. And, you know, in all of my quiet moments in life, I was sitting there going, if I'm feeling this with the privilege and the community and the love that I have around me oh my God, how must blank feel with this? And that often, you know, leads to what I do next. Um, but um, yeah, the, with the, the non-striving piece, um, I think it's, diff it's also difficult. It kind of like goes in line with the excellence versus perfection week. Um, I think, you know, grief is something that we'd rather do than be you know, and that's something that gets brought up a lot. And, and it unfortunately is more of a being thing. And that's why right at the beginning of the book, I say, ultimately, you will decide, you know, and I hope you choose to be. Um, and, and that's just the opportunity to be exactly where you are. And I think that trying to apply, you know, I kind of, I, I do bring this up a lot, because I do it, you know, in these different Trojan horses of excellence versus perfection, flow versus force. These are all sort of the same idea of, you know, not striving for a result, but striving to show up each and every day fully to what's happening in the moment. Um, and I, I think that that is the piece of this. And I feel like I want to apologize that there's no special trick or, you know, life hack in the book, but the ultimate life hack for me is to do life fully, you know, and, and deal with what comes from that. And mm -hmm. also to, you know, I love this part in any interview where I get to say, reap the benefits. What, what's wild about my story is not those three deaths and the other ones that happened and, you know, everything that I've been through. What's wild about my story is that I laugh hysterically so often and I still want to love and I still want to be a dad and I have hope and awe and I'm moved by sunsets. I mean, that's what's wild is I didn't think that I would, I would have access to that. I didn't think I'd be willing to even, you know, bond with anything or anyone like it just seems so illogical oh god you're proud of yourself Addison are you gonna cry right now um it's but wonderful. you know that that's the wild part for me as I sit around more often than not in absolute gratitude and the magic you know all the moments where it just wasn't gonna work the the mental health resources and what was going on in my life and the grief being so heavy it just didn't seem like it was gonna work out it always felt like I was in game seven and we were down and I just wanted to apologize to everybody that I just I didn't think it was gonna work you know and I and I would try I would try till the buzzer goes off but I don't see it working, you know, and I've had that feeling many times. Life. And then when I get to look back, when I get through those moments and you, you know, you win that series because it's another series starts, you know, immediately, but you think that's the be all and end all, you know, you win or lose that series and you go, there's part of this that Mary Frances was science and I can't explain from the pure perspective, Brene Brown can't even explain that there is just magic that happens when it happens, that connects you and creates the life that you have and how you get to be here and you know how you get to show up in the world. And um, that for me is what I sit around going like, that's wild. You know, that's just wild that that has always shown up, that, that, that we're talking about a book. Also, no one has ever read my own book to me. <laughs> on record on air <laughs> so obviously that is something i'm taking away too that like it must be real i guess now i guess i have to go and like actually sit in <laughs> that this really happened and this can exist for people and and you know i always say to people even if you just listen to this conversation get the physical book it can sit around in your house it can be on the shelf it can rot in your gym bag but even if just seeing the outside of this book reminds you for one second to stop fixing and to honor or to be a little kind or to be a little more compassionate you know or to stay curious then i'm good you don't have to read a word i i, I don't i don't care i will not take it personally you know and if you're really feeling stuck you know with trying to support somebody who's lost somebody i really hope after 
you know, hearing me speak today and maybe reading the book yourself, that it is something you might feel compelled in place of flowers that might wilt in a week or, you know, well-intentioned mm. casseroles that you might allow me to be your friend's friend or your loved one's friend for a year in this amazing way that I've created where I can also go on and focus on love and hope without actually being with someone who's grieving all the time, because my, my end goal was never to become a grief counselor or a grief coach or any of these things. You know, I, I want to be a dad and, you know, write stories that make people feel connected. And I always thought I would do that in fiction. I never thought that I would have a story myself that, you know, made people feel connected. But as I sort of return back to that, and I, I'm sitting with that inner child, like I said, since this book come out, I'm going, okay, you've achieved a lot. There was a long list. And now for me, when, in terms of what's coming next, a large focus of prioritization on love and laughter and connecting, like, and it sounds wild because I'm, you know, why aren't you taking off with your career and building a whole brand around this? Or when's the second book due? And it's just something that's taken 14 years of honoring to go, this is the priority. And I promise that nine-year-old 20 two years ago that I would always prioritize this and I haven't, you know, I've, I've put achievement and these other things ahead of it. So that's the best way I can describe where I'm non-striving right now mm. is settling down those thoughts that in order to have value that I need to be helping others at all times. Um, and so this book in that sense is therapeutic for me because it gets to exist without me. I get to be in rooms and in people's hearts without being there. And that is so freeing to me because anybody who's listening to this, especially from a grief perspective, is that you probably don't want to sit in grief for the rest of your life, especially with people at all alternative stages of their own grief. When you know you can't help anyone else, you can just learn how to help yourself. So, you know, it's, it, it's kind of funny, but I'm like the grief guy who does not want to you know, be in, in a one-on-one -on -one grief situation. It's just, you know, that's my most beautiful and natural honesty is like that the book got me out of the freeze, you know, mm -hmm. and what do I know about this? And so, um, yeah, it's available everywhere on Amazon. I um, I have a bunch of free resources too. My book is being, um, sorry, my book, my website's being updated, um, which is either addisonbrazil.com, Brazil, like the country, but with an S as my father always said, um, and mygriefclub.com. I'm on Instagram. Um, and I'm, I I'm out there honoring being equal parts, honor the journey and find the funny. And I think that's important for people as they find me to know that, that I have no intention of giving up the funny. So it might be, you know, something really wild and funny one day and then something that really is deep and connects with you about grief the next day that's who i am and that's who i get to be so if you're into that um you now know where to find me and um i will in the coming months i've been in pre-production on a podcast that um will basically be take my book as a launching point because people have sort of been thirsty for more and like i said i'm not the expert so i have deeper conversations based on each week that may serve people more and may direct them to an expert that they can then speak to because as you're getting the central theme here i'm i'm not that guy i'm i'm in the grief arena too i'm just you know working out beside you and you know, I, I'm happy that I, you know, got to welcome you in and, and someone was at the gym that day kind of thing. Um, but um, thank you so much. Thank you for the yeah. safe space. And it's a testament to you too, that I agreed to do this on a day that I knew would be challenging for me. And, um, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I really do. I think there's no better tribute to my father than two grown men who are taking time out of their day to discuss mental health a decade later, because that um, that's not something I was seeing a decade ago, and it certainly wasn't something that he was seeing. So, um, you know, it's sometimes awkward to bring up my dad because of what happened, but I'm just going to end this by saying cheers to Henry Brazil, because um, I'm always, you know, I just, that's my dad, and I, I loved him so much, and, you know, we don't get to do that that often. It's hard in our family sometimes to bring him up and celebrate him, and, you um, that's what I'll be doing this evening. So, so thank you for all the reminders today. Uh, I feel like I interviewed you. Um, and thank you to everybody who listened to this episode, of course. Yeah, well, thank you, Addison. I, I don't have any words to, to say, but again, thank you. It's, I feel so sort of enriched 
uh, by everything you shared with us and your insight and experience and, and wisdom. And yeah, it's beautiful to see. Thank you for sharing that with the world and doing it so honorably. Um, and yeah, uh, sort of in the show notes, as they always say, will be uh, links to all your work so people can find you there. And um, yeah, thank you again. Keep up the great work. And thanks for sharing your time with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't need any words. Just how about one more of those deep breaths and <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on my way. That. Thank you. <laughs>